Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 7 which is dealing with exponential and logarithmic relationships. Now later on in the chapter we will look at logarithms but for now we're just going to focus on exponentials and I wanted to make sure that we were on the same page as to what makes something an exponential versus something that had an exponent like the stuff that we've been dealing with. For example, y equals x squared looks familiar. We've been working with functions like this that's called a polynomial if you remember. On the other hand, y equals 2 to the x, I have an exponent that's a variable. That is an exponential. These will behave quite differently, so let's take a look at the parent function of an exponential growth. So I'll know whether I have a growth or decay, which we'll look at in a little bit, based off of my b value. If my b is greater than 1, I know I have a growth. So for example, that one that we just saw above, 2 to the x, is an example of a growth. My domain for growths is always going to be all real numbers. For my parent function, I am all positive real numbers. If I shift up or down, that'll move accordingly. My asymptote is the x-axis. Now asymptote is a line that the graph gets closer and closer and closer to but never reaches or crosses. So when I say the x-axis is an asymptote, I'm going to get ever, ever, ever so close to my x-axis but I will never touch it. I will never have a y value of 0 and I will never cross it. So in this case I would never have a negative y value. And my y-intercept is 0, 1 all of these exponentials will have some sort of y-intercept, just a matter of where. If I haven't shifted left, right, or up, or down, it's going to be at 0, 1, because anything to the 0 power is 1. So I have starred these points. Typically when we are graphing these, unless you want to make a table every time, you can graph your, sort of your initial point, plug in one point to the left and one point to the right, and then you'll have a pretty good idea of how your graph looks like. So let's take a look at one. If I was going to be graphing y equals 4 to the x, I also want to state the domain and the range. Now I haven't shifted left, right, up, or down, so my domain is going to be all real numbers, as it will always be. And my range, since I've not shifted, is y is greater than 0. Notice it's not greater than or equal to, since that x-axis is an asymptote, I will never have an actual y-value of 0. So one option is to make yourself a table. We can plug in negative 2, so I have 4 to the negative second. Remember that negative exponent brings our answer down to the bottom. So I have 1 16th, 4 to the negative first, 1 over 4, anything to 0 is 1. 4 to the first, and 4 squared. So I can plot these points, or I can use the idea of the intercept and the one point to the left and one point to the right. I see that this 4 is a number that's bigger than 1, so I should look like a growth, so growing from left to right. My intercept, 0, 1. If I plug in one point to the left, I have 1 over 4 and you're just going to be approximating because you're going to be getting really close to that x-axis. And then one point to the right, 4 to the first, is 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. My x-axis serves as my asymptote, so I'll never reach it or cross it. And that gives me a nice sketch of my graph. You're more than welcome to plot more than three points, but three points usually suffices to get a nice idea of how it's growing. Where there is growth, there's also potential decay. So if our b value is between 0 and 1, such as 1 half, I know that my, instead of growing from left to right, it's going to be falling. It's going to be decaying from left to right, as you see in our model here. Our domain is still all real numbers, range is still positive reals if we haven't shifted up or down. Our asymptote is still going to be that x-axis and our intercept is still going to be 0, 1. And again, 
plotting one point to the left, one point to the right, usually serves as a nice guide. So as our parent functions always tend to do, we can move. But the good news is, everything behaves just as you would normally. The only thing is our parent function looks a little bit different, so we kind of have to slightly shift our thinking. H still controls the horizontal shift, being the opposite of what it looks. I like to think of all these shifts in terms of my intercept point. So for example, if my you know, exponent up here is x plus 3, I know I've shifted that intercept point to the left 3. K still controls the vertical shift, normal. So if it says plus 2, it is moving up 2. This will also move our asymptote. So if it says plus 2, we have shifted that asymptote up 2, so y is going to be greater than, in that case, 2. And a still controls our orientation and shape. So if it's less than 0, we are reflecting over the x-axis, so everything's going to be below instead of above. And it also tells us how quickly it rises or falls. So let's take a look at a graph with all of these shifts in place. So, domain, all real numbers. Don't even have to think about it. Range, we have to think about how we've shifted. I know it's going to be a y, and then it's going to have something to do with that 2. Because that a value is negative 4, that tells me I have reflected over the x-axis. So instead of everything going above, it's going to be below. So y is going to be less than 2. That 1 half in that b position tells me I have a decay. The x minus 1 in my exponent tells me I have shifted to the right one, because remember it's the opposite of what you might think it might be. And that plus 2 on the outside tells me that I have shifted up 2. So as I have shifted right 1, if I mentally think of my table, and I'm going to be focusing around 1, 1 to the left would be 0, 1 to the right would be 2, so let's plug in that 1. If I plug in 1, I have an exponent of 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. Let's plug in 0. I've got 1 half to the negative first. Remember that, so it's going to be taken to the first power, and the numerator denominator will flip. So I've got 2. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 2 is negative 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When I plug in 2, I've got 1 half to the first. 1 half times negative 4 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Draw in your asymptote. Asymptote of 2 on the y-axis. And I like to usually start closer to the asymptote as opposed to always going from left to right. So that is my decay flipped upside down with an asymptote of 2. Now with word problems, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, you're going to write your equation, and then if you have to graph it, it's absolutely going to be totally understandable and expected that you use your calculator to make a sketch and then find any data that you would need. So 
we're going to be using the general form of a of t, which is going to be like the final amount, equals a, which is your initial amount, and then either 1 plus r or 1 minus r, depending on if it's a growth or decay, where r is a decimal, and then to the t, which represents time, or sometimes it'll be something like distance, or some other obscure thing where this can still model. Um, for example, in the one below, we are talking about distance. Often it's going to be time, but it's really whatever other variable you would be manipulating. So if I'm looking at this problem, the pressure of the atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch at the Earth's surface. It decreases by about 20% for each mile of altitude up to about 50 miles. Write an equation that would help model this situation. Sometimes they will give you extraneous information. This up to 50 miles just tells you that if you go above 50 miles above the Earth's surface, the, your equation's not going to work. I wouldn't tell you to find the pressure at 60 miles if your equation would only work up to 50 miles. I wouldn't do that to you. So let's take a look. I do see the word decreases, so I know I'm going to be using that 1 minus r to the t function. And so I start writing it a to the t equals my initial amount, 14.7. 1 minus, I need to write my rate as a decimal. So remember, just move over your decimal point twice to the t which in this case is going to be talking about distance above the Earth's surface, but t suffices. So my equation that models this situation is 14.7 times 0.8 to the t. Now remember the order of operations. If you were going to be plugging this in without looking at the whole graph, you would have to do the exponent first, then multiply by the 14.7. So this would be our final answer. Any sort of data you would need off of this, you would be able to plug in for T and get the pressure at that distance above the Earth's surface. So that's about it. We'll look at more of this in class, and I'll see you then.